I'll kick us off here. Um, this is Julie speaking, and I just want to welcome everybody into this room. And just a few tips as we get started. As I've just mentioned, many of you have heard this. Just you can use the plus sign at the bottom to ping people into this room that you think may be interested in joining us. You can use the search bar to uh, narrow down uh, to specific words that might be in their bio or uh, specific people's names. Be sure to check out other people in the room. Follow them. Um, please follow our moderators and panelists and co-hosts here today. Uh, we do encourage everyone to raise their digital hand if you have a question or would like to get involved. Uh, and we'll certainly do our best to get to everybody, but we encourage participation. Uh, for those that do not know Consuli, we broadly are a public benefit company with a mission to enable individuals to participate in the data economy uh, with experts suggesting our individual data being worth 20,000 per year. Um, we do this by operating a marketplace for members where we become their agent and assemble patients, health records, labs, prescriptions, wearables, quality of life surveys. Um, importantly, members receive smart matched individualized offers from us for opportunities, including to participate in clinical trials, which this room is a good audience for. Um, there's no cost for anyone to join our movement. You can learn more about us at consuli.net. That's C-O-N-S-U-L-I.net. All of this information in the rooms that we are hosting are in my bio, so uh, be sure to follow me if you'd like to be pinged into any of those rooms in the future. My email is in there if you'd like to directly connect. Um, it's now my pleasure to turn the floor over to our room co-facilitators, um, Talia, Hi, and Heather Williams, um, who will be introducing themselves and our guests. Over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Julie. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the Clubhouse. Uh, this is our fourth session of what's really turning out to be a great club for clinical trialists, for pharma industry execs, and for patients that are interested in discussing burning questions in clinical trials. Um, I'm Talia Height. My background is really in all things trial site operations. I've worked in clinical operations and over to business operations as well. Now I'm with an early stage startup in the trial space, and I really love taking this opportunity every week to bring trial enthusiasts together into the room to talk about our one burning question, and just thrilled to be co-moderating this discussion each week. Um, today's co-moderator joining me for the Clinical Trials Clubhouse is Heather Williams, and Heather will introduce herself in just a minute. You can learn more about all of us on the panel by uh, checking out our Clubhouse profile, as Julie was just mentioning. And um, for newcomers, this can be done by simply clicking on our face <laughs> on your app. Um, let's see. So gaining insights from experts in a fun and innovative way is what really gave rise to the Clinical Trials Clubhouse idea. And we're fortunate to work with Consuli, a really innovative team who are enabling data and AI for good in this case, in healthcare and trials. We know your time is important, so we're gonna keep this Clubhouse session to an hour, maybe a little bit more. Um, during this time, we'll be addressing this week's one burning question, which comes from a discussion during the last five minutes of our program each week. And we really um, like to pull our room in that last, last five minutes to get suggestions, and then that is where we sort of select from our next one burning question for next week. So. We really um, rely on the engagement uh, in this clubhouse room to set the stage for what we're going to discuss in the future. So let's go ahead and get us started. Heather, do you want to kind of kick us off? Sure. Thanks so much, Talia. Um, so hi, everybody. It's so really great to see you guys all here today. Uh, my name is Heather Williams. Uh, I'm the head of project management and customer success for a global e-clinical technology partner. So we work with startups uh, all the way to large pharma and med tech to help them successfully plan and execute their clinical trials. And I also have a personal connection to the patient, patient side of the health and life sciences industry. So I'm always excited to 
talk about anything focused on how tech and innovative ideas can really improve and expedite studies, but more importantly, how can these sorts of novel approaches help with patient advocacy and really improve the clinical trial patient journey overall. So thanks to the Consuli team for always hosting these amazing rooms every week and those who joined us. So let's uh, open the discussion on this week's One Burning Question and we're going to get that going. But just before we do that, I want to say hello to the wonderful people we have on stage today this morning with us. Um, so maybe you can all do a quick introduction and if I can start with you, Jimmy, because you're right next after me uh, from Access TCA, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, great. Thank you for having me here. Um, this is my first clubhouse, so I'm so I'm extra thrilled to to participate today. I am the senior director of strategy at Access TCA, uh, which is an engagement design agency uh, specific to uh, healthcare, biopharma, and uh, life sciences clients. We work with them to engage their audiences, be that HCPs at. at trade shows and conventions and industry meetings or patients um, on the patient events side. So while I am not, full disclosure, an expert in clinical trial design or clinical trial governance, I am an expert in engaging uh, different audiences in the healthcare space. So really happy to be here. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much for joining us, Jimmy. It'll be great to get your insights. Uh, Princess Stout from Health Research Development. Could you tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Um, my name is Princess, and I work as a clinical research nurse and uh, the nurse manager over uh, at New Hope Research Development. Um, so we are a site management organization and also a standalone um, clinical company that's based in Whittier, California. And what we do is we just partner up with um, a, you know different multi-specialty network of physicians, investigators who are interested in um, clinical research for all phases of study. Um, in a wide therapeutic range. Great, thank you so much. And I see you still have your little party popper beside your name. So welcome to Clubhouse. And for anybody else in the room who's new, we are a very welcoming group. So if you have uh, anything you want to ask, just please feel free to jump in even if you're new. Um, on that note, uh, can I turn it over to you for Tammy? Tammy Burke from Sarepta to introduce yourself. Hi, this is Tammy Burke. Um, I also am a nurse. And I see that my little party popper has disappeared, so um, I feel more welcome uh, to be a part of this for a little bit longer and excited to um, share ideas and learn new ideas with everybody else um, that's in this, uh, in this clubhouse today. My background is oncology, so I was a I've been an oncology nurse for, oh, I don't know, 20 years or more now. Uh, and I, so I have the a view from the sponsor side, working at different, a couple different sponsors, working on the patient side as a nurse, um, haven't really been on the site side, so I'm always interested in learning more about what makes sites work and what makes them better. Uh, so uh, yeah, thank you again for having me, I'm, I'm excited and I, I think this is just a, a wonderful forum to just promote growth within each each one of us and just to be able to, to flourish and um, and just you know just bring more innovative if that's the word of the day uh, design and trials and ideas to patients so that we can get these drugs to them quicker fantastic thank you so much Tammy what a great group we have today uh, okay so let's get started um, as we're beginning our conversation today please for everyone in the audience we really do like to have your opinions and thoughts so feel free to raise your hand at any point in time we're going to have a little bit of conversation at the beginning from our panel and then we'll be uh, inviting folks up to ask their question and provide their input uh, so feel free to raise your hand at any point in time and Julie will start bringing people up to be able to engage when you do come up on the stage if you can just remember to mute your mic as soon as you arrive on the stage then when it's time for you to speak you can unmute that would be really great thanks so much um, so let's get going our burning question for today is gamification AI patient concierges there are so many innovations in patient recruitment what's working or what isn't working and what could be implemented to help sites that we might not have thought of yet um, so we're going to get started with our panelists and then we're going to open it up to everybody else so maybe I can start with you James with your background when you think about virtual meetings being the norm and uh, everything that you've experienced over the last year, I know there's a lot of changes that have happened. What can you share with us about trends you've seen in physician and allied health practitioner engagement online? And maybe touch on what kind of tools you think might work being applied to engage with patients. 
Um, so maybe you can start with that on our one burning question, and I'll turn it over to you, Jenny. Sure, that's great, and a, and a super uh, interesting question and an important one, um, especially as you know, my industry, as you as you alluded to, ground to a halt a little over a year ago. Um, and so we saw with the with the absence absence of uh, in person meetings and live events and industry conferences. To your point, everything moved online and moved virtually. Um, over the course of the past year, there have been a number of trends that have uh, emerged, um, especially around what's working and what can be improved and what might hang on uh, throughout the course of, of the next round of, of evolution in the industry. Um, one of the things that we're finding specific to HCPs, doctors, nurses, and and, and other health professionals um, is that they are really missing the networking aspect of what these industry meetings provide. It's sort of that spontaneous uh, collaboration and the, the spontaneous transfer of, of education. You, know, you bump into an old colleague from, from med school that you haven't seen in a while, or uh, you're sitting next to someone who shares an opinion or, or, or differs an opinion, and you strike up a conversation. Um, those sort of happenstance moments are really, really hard to replicate in a, in a virtual setting when everything's moved on. Um, they are, uh, as, we, as, as we talk to, to HCPs and, and, and other healthcare professionals, uh, those are the, the biggest, that's the biggest opportunity, I think, um, moving forward in, in a virtual world. Um, or as, as we move into what we've been calling a hybrid world, that is part, part online, part offline, part remote, part online. Um, I think, I think, your question, the second part of your question, to answer that, um, there is, it's, it's a little bit different, but similar in terms of uh, the opportunity for technology to bridge the gap. I think um, when, we, when we think about HCPs, there, there's that networking aspect, there's that spontaneous education, that spontaneous collaboration, when we think about patients and patient marketing, um, they really want to feel like they're part of a community, and they want to feel like they're part of something bigger. I know, um, you know, having having discussed with with patients, um, a big part of, of being ill is feeling alone um, and feeling isolated. And so, these these patient events, you know, you throw one out there, for example, with the um, walk MS walks put on by the National MS Society, um, nationwide walks. Um, what they're trying to do there is build community, make sure that patients know that they're not going about this alone, that there are people that they can talk to, like-minded people, people going through the same experience. So when we think about virtual in terms of HCP, you want to build that community. And here it's more around education and transfer of knowledge and collaboration. But I still think when we're when we're looking at the we're looking ahead over the course of the next 12 to 15 to 18 months, we want to make sure that we're building that community from a patient perspective as well. Um, and we're, we're, we're creating opportunities for patients to connect and not feel so isolated. Yeah, that's, those are really great insights, Jimmy. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. I'm, cu I'm curious about, um, about the sort of the, the fact that we have moved into more of this virtual um, world, this more online world. Are you are you seeing that in your in from your perspective, and to apply directly to patients? Do you think that's helping or hurting um, the, the engagement aspect? Of course, not having an MS walk as an example because we, we maybe haven't been able to sort of gather in person. That's one component. Do you think that there's a case to uh, you know that 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 this online engagement is is helping patients engage more? You know, I think it's I think it's certainly easier for patients to engage more in this in this online only virtual only uh, realm that we've we've entered to entered into. I think uh, for a long time, you know, many of my clients are, are pharmaceutical uh, companies or, or you know drug, uh, drug developers and, and things like that. Um, and for a long time, they've really shied away from anything online, anything virtual. Um, Anything, anything digital, especially when it comes to engaging patients. And so I think over the course of the past 12 months, we've seen some, some changing of mindsets. We've seen some, some rapid innovation in my industry and other industries and, and, uh, and uh, a greater push to be able to get all 
online. I think one of the benefits of a of a virtual only world is that you can you can touch far more people um, in the sense of you, you have a much broader reach, um, regardless of, of who the audience is. Now, the the value of the exchange of education or or the the whether you're able to exchange, you know, collaborate, network, and things like that as effectively is, is, is another discussion. But I think one of the benefits of the virtual world, especially as it relates to patients, is that there's a much broader reach than, than what we see in, in some of these in-person meetings. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, Tammy, do you have some insights on this? Anything from your perspective? I'd have to echo a lot of what Jimmy said, but I do feel that the pandemic has really opened a lot more access for patients. Um, you know, when difficult for patients in certain areas to travel, all of these new, um, you know, sites that are now working remotely uh, with patients, I, I just think it, it enables it enables us to reach more patients, and it enables them to be able to. <laughs> Tammy, I think you heard Walter's do. Sorry, I think the connection was a little bit bad. Could you could you try again, just the last ten seconds or so? Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Is that any better? I think we're hearing you. Go, go again. Go ahead again, and if we need to we're sort still of in a bad spot. Yeah, you know what? Why don't we pause for a second, Tammy? That's okay. Let's let's go to Princess, and we'll come back to you. Thank you. Princess, what are your thoughts on this? Okay. Um, no, no worries, Tammy. Princess, maybe okay. share your thoughts on innovation and recruitment. You know, you. Sure. Um, just kind of going off of what um, Jimmy had shared with, you know, the being online, having a broader reach, and, you know, with the whole also uh, with the um, moving towards remote. Um, missing a part of that uh, community building. Um, as far as the site perspective, um, the information for clinical research and uh, studies that are out there, it's it's reached through a broader perspective. It's not like how it was before where we received just mail or word of mouth in these clinical trials, but now it's online. But also the other part of that is um, the internet can also be a little bit overwhelming with the amount of information readily available at our, you know, at our fingertips. So I think for just patient recruitment, um, the site being readily available to answer any questions that a potential participant may have um, is very important. And just being the site also being ready to answer those um, questions to kind of make them feel more that they're part of a community that will help in advancing uh, the clinical trials since we do need their participation in order for us to move forward um, with these new trials and moving forward with um, putting them out in the market, those things. So definitely the internet and just being online has helped a lot. Um, I think that with that we can mix the old in a new way as well, being able to communicate with patients in a different way, um, you know, not limiting ourselves to phone calls, um, but also either through our social media platforms or um, different platforms that we can give more information to the patients. That's really great. Thanks, Princess, for sharing that. Um, Tammy, if, if you want to try again here, let's, let's give it a shot. Okay, can you hear, can you hear me now? Sure can, yep. Yeah. All right, I missed everything. I'm sorry that Princess said. I just have really bad connectivity issues, and I apologize. Um, so I, I will echo um, what Jimmy said. I do feel that it's um, we have seen a surge in, in maybe patient, um, patient activity, if you will, in the clinical trial center at the sites because they don't have to worry about travel and how they're going to get to a site. If we can if we can get them into a, a study and in a site without having them travel, um, if we can do a lot of this remotely, whether it be through you know 
video or audio or whatever other way we can do it, maybe visiting nurses. Um, this, I think it's an, an enormous step forward for our clinical trial reform, as I call it. Yeah, thank you, Tammy. It's really great. Um, thanks very much, Princess Jimmy and Tammy, for sort of kicking things off. I think you um, said a lot of insightful things that gives our room, uh, our clubhouse room here, some things to think on, and we're going to get ready to open the discussion up to everybody. Um, just a reminder that it, as you're hearing speakers, um, people up on the stage, feel free to check them out and check out others in the room where you might feel inspired and you can follow new people um, with party hats to sort of support them and make sure you're um, following the host, the moderators, and any of the panelists or um, people up on stage if you're, um, you know, liking what they're saying or, or want to sort of see sort of what else they might be up to here in Clubhouse. So let's go ahead and start to open up the room. We just brought Matt up to the stage. Uh, Matt, do you have a question or maybe some insights here? Yeah, hi, Talia. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt. Thanks for bringing me up. I just think it's really neat. Um, I, I like the conversation that, that um, Jimmy and Tammy and Princess were having. The way I look at the world, I think, you know, the pandemic has, for all its negatives, it's brought clinical trial awareness at a mass population level. And then you have the, the virtual trials breaking down access barriers. And, and then the piece that I really key on with work I do is the ability to drive greater awareness and I feel like um, you know the key to people being online is making them more aware of the research available to them I think it opens up a whole new aspect of connecting patients into clinical trials that was not there before and now people maybe don't see well this is the question I guess with that intro do you think with with the level of exposure clinical trials got from the pandemic that as a population, people see it more friendly and more willing to participate. And that's kind of my question. Great question. Do any of our Jimmy, Princess Tammy, I'd love to hear your responses to that because you you all are coming from very different perspectives. Any any reactions to Matt's question? It, it's Tammy. I'll say something quick, Matt. I think that is really a, a, something that's been great. Like you said, that's happened in the during the pandemic. I think that people have seen how quickly we can bring a treatment forth with, with getting a clinical trial completely uh, filled in, in such a short period of time. So I do feel that the awareness has helped us quite a bit. I'm curious to see how physicians, other physicians that have kept it close to the vest and not wanting to let their patients go for various different reasons. I'm interested to see how their reaction is going to be and how they will maybe suggest more, or, or maybe not, um, a clinical trial to a patient who has exhausted many other avenues of treatment. I like that, Tammy. That's something we deal with a lot, especially especially in areas where there's, there's, uh, there's sites that are participating in the trial. How freely will they let patients move between? So thanks for that insight. That's good. Great. Right. There's, I mean, there's many different reasons, and you know, one of them we know is Tammy. We might have lost you again in a in a bad connection area. Um, so we'll circle back on that. Uh, Jimmy or Princess, just any reactions to to Matt's uh, question? You, you know, I'm, as, as I mentioned in my introduction, I'm definitely not an expert in in clinical trial. I I am a marketer. Um, and I am a, uh, I, I do, my, I, I, my background is in, in, in marketing and strategy and, and things like that. And I think um, from, a, from a marketing perspective, uh, the pandemic did. Um, That's fine. Yeah, I'm sorry, could you hear me? I, I think I might have lost you all for a bit. I'm so sorry, my connectivity is so poor. That's okay, Tammy. Um, Jimmy was just, uh, he was jumping in and talking about some things from a marketing perspective. Yeah, I, I think, you know, from a marketing perspective, uh, general public uh, opinion of, of the pharmaceutical industry and, and clinical trials uh, more specifically uh, was, was actually very favorable. Um, seeing, seeing different companies come in and collaborate um, with each other, uh, to Tammy's point, the speed at which the, the trials were completed um, effectively and, and, and safely. Um, and 
and how quickly uh, the industry was was able to innovate. I, I think it I think it did uh, a, a lot of good for for the pharmaceutical industry for sure. Kind of here, just to jump in on something you pointed out there, sort of briefly, Jimmy, which was about the collaboration between um, industry, and I think that it's sort of one of the under some points of what happened through this pandemic, which was there's there's a very uh, sort of aggressive angst, you know, internationally against uh, pharmaceutical companies and seeing all of these companies come together and, and communicate together in a way that was supportive of what was being done to handle this virus, I think has done wonders that, that maybe we, we haven't sort of collectively recognized to say that this industry is not out to get you, this industry is really trying to do good things and there's a lot of things that can be improved, but the communication there I think is really important, so I, I really like that point, thanks Matt and Heather and Densky Dean. Thanks, Heather. Um, Princess, you know whether whether it's a, a reaction to the question question that Matt posed um, from the site perspective, or just any other thoughts you might have on what is what is important to to patients that you're hearing from patients you're interacting with at the site level, or to be effective in in, in recruiting at the site level. Um, any thoughts on any of that? Sure. Um, just to comment a little bit more on what um, Matt shared, and um, also to Jimmy's point, just the collaboration has really helped um, in this past few months it was in regards to clinical trials. Um, the fact that all these different, um, you know, are collaborating to work together, it kind of gives participants a little bit more ease and um, thinking that, yes, pharmaceuticals are not out to get them, and it actually these trials are here to help um, to help uh, put forth a new um, treatment out there. And so for patients, I think just that um, ability to be well informed is so important for them. So with the information being readily available and different ways that we can quickly communicate um, clinical trials now with an aging technology has really helped because everybody just wants to be informed before they sign up for something. Um, and so even sending out informed consent um, via email so that they can have time by themselves or, you know, discuss it with um, someone important to them, their doc, gives them that sense of um, control in participating in the trial, even though the control has always been for them, everything is voluntary. But just that extra step of really knowing that they would like to participate in this trial and for you know, confirming the reasons that they have um, helped with recruitment and also retention of the patient. Princess, I'm really glad you brought up consent because one of the things I think we rushed to do during the pandemic was get consents online, which which is great, um, but somehow maybe lost the consult the consultative aspect of a consent where you're you're hearing from your physician what exactly you're consenting to and getting that knowledge. And I think that's a great opportunity for, for us to do better with these online consent tools and incorporate the conversation around the consent, which, which is actually more important than signing a piece of paper to the patient. Uh, so I'm really glad you brought that up. Yes, definitely, Matt. Um, you know, for us specifically, we don't ask them to sign online consents. We kind of just ask them to go read through it so that we can discuss um, a bit more in person, but I think just giving them, giving them that power that they have the information that they need on hand before they go to a site gives them a different sense of confidence that they know what they're doing. Yep, absolutely. Um, because we're sort of seeing, we're having this discussion around consent, so I'd love to ask anyone in the room, anyone on the stage, um, you know, I think the, the rush to put to put consents either online or at least at minimum to be able to, to send them out electronically and, and things like that, that, that was something that, that definitely happened. There's, there's tools that are out there now um, and, and I'm sure they're sort of gaining wide adoption uh, both because of the pandemic and also just the general move toward sort of a, a decentralized model that allow for the consents to be administered not just electronically but the whole process to be done virtually through video visits um active um, engagement around you know that that whole consent process 
wanting to ask anybody if they've got any sort of um, impressions from any of those systems, any good experiences, bad, anything they want to share directly about what their experience might be having done sort of that remote consent. And by remote, I mean really an electronically or virtual engaged consent. Any inputs from anyone? I can speak, it's Heather here, I can speak from the uh, provider side because we do, uh, we're actually working through a completion of our e-consent model at this point in time and so it's going to be a module that attaches onto our e-clinical technology platform and we've spent quite a bit of time talking to a lot of stakeholders about what they're looking for and, and, and to what Matt and Princess were both saying, how to appropriately inform a patient online um, sort of it, it, with the right amount of time, with the right protections, without giving inappropriate information that could be influencing is actually a real challenge. Um, I don't know if anybody else in the audience might have some thoughts on this, but it, it's something that uh, the answer that, that we've gotten is it's, uh, it's all over the map still in terms of what people really want and there's really simple versions and there's really complex versions. And, and I really liked what Matt said about sort of incorporating a bigger picture of what other people's inputs were. And we talked about this a little bit last week about, you know, how do you connect patients with each other without compromising on uh, confidentiality of personal health information and, you know, what, where they're going to be in the study. Uh, so it was really tricky for us and, and we're uh, right in the weeds for it. So if there's anybody who has any thoughts on that in the audience who might want to raise their hand and share their thoughts, uh, I would love to hear your opinions. I'm Heather and then speaking. That's great. Thanks, Heather. We just invited um, Hanley to the stage. Hanley, welcome. Any thoughts on that? Um, I've got a very unique uh, one that is pretty. Uh, have, have you any guys uh, heard of all of us recent program or project? Yep, sure have. Have, have you volunteered yourself on, on that recent I haven't, no. I have. So, I, I used to work in uh, UCSF as a clinical research coordinator for the All of Us Research Program, funded by NIH, right? So, <laughs> you remember, right, when you go in, there's a computer, and you you just sit down and watch a video and answer the test. And that's a very unique type of consent. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's the model that every uh, place should be doing right now under COVID times, right? Yeah, that's interesting. I, Elizabeth, I don't know as if, if you were a participant in that, if you have um, any potential uh, input on, on your experience sort of building on what Hanley might have said. Yeah, and I think Hanley's really raising the issue of the very good discussion that was uh, a function of the one burning question, I think, last week, right? A lot of discussion on the issue of patient consent and how to improve the process of making sure patients understand what they're consenting to. Um, I'll defer to the other clinicians here who, you know, interact with patients and understand this um, better. Um, but I... I, I echo what Hanley's articulating. I think there needs to be far more education up front, as we've discussed, so folks really understand the journey, and I think that addresses the legitimate informed consent versus, you know, shoving a whole bunch of paper forms at people with long text and legalese that, you know, isn't as decipherable, right? So, so you know, the main question is, I mean, I, I've done health on, on, on the Department of Oncology, right? And we do consents all the time. And of course, we have to plan it, uh, you know, every single page, plan the bill of rights, plan this and that, right? It's kind of like, you know, you're, you're with a patient. Let's say, for example, um, you know, you said something wrong, right? You know, said, said something that, oh, you have misspoke. You go to court. Hey, hey, hey uh, you know this clinical research coordinator said this. In the end of the day, right? You sign that paper, right? You sign that paper. Hey, you consented it, right? It, it's, it's his word against your word, right? So basically, of course, 
as a clinical research coordinator, you should be, you should know what you're talking about and know how to explain it to your patient right? or, or your participant. Right? But you know, um, I, I, I think to ease, easily streamline process, right? When you go having this computer, right? So, so all of us research program, when, when you first come in, you sit down, you you watch video, right? Basically, a lot of human beings, right? They they learn by what we call visual, right? Their learning modalities are are, are visual, right? But they're they're kinesthetic and tactile, so they see, they do, they click, right? And they learn. Many people are like that, and some people of course are. Right? But you know, when you click on those things, and and, and the end of the, the video, there's a test, right? You pass the test. And that means you understand what they're talking about, right? So if you go to court and they say, "Oh, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I didn't, I don't, I don't believe this," or, or you know, uh, I, you know, this, this is uh, not what they say, right? At the end of the day, when you go to court, hey, you pass the test and you agree to it, right? That's the bottom line. So it's kind of no, I mean, you understand it, they, they try to simplify it uh, for you to, you know, legality wise, right? And then you, you click all the dots and you click yes, right? You pass all the tests and you click yes, you're agreeing with it. I think I understand what you're saying, Tether here. Uh, the, the idea of the standardization of using something electronic and remote, uh, it makes sense in terms of the consistency and the messaging. And I and I do agree with your point, Hanley, about the fact that um, from an enrollment perspective and a, and a retention perspective, being able to be sure that you're being consistent with every patient when you introduce them to what this opportunity is with this study and what the risks are, that, that technically um, a system that's providing that exact same message in the exact same way to every single potential patient is going to afford you the opportunity to just say that you've been very, very clear and, and consistent in how you've communicated it versus opening it up to the potential uh, variations that might come with somebody who's orally explaining to someone what they're looking at on a piece of paper. So I think it's it's a good point. Um, if, I can, if, if anyone has anything else to jump in on, please do. I did have one other thing I wanted to ask about, so I'll just be quiet for a second uh, before I raise a, a new point. No? Um, so one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking, Hanley, and as the, as the group was talking, was around uh, this idea of getting patients engaged and, and increasing patient enrollment and communicating between patients about the potential of what they could do when it comes to enrolling in a trial. And this might be sort of a, a it could be a contentious question, but we talked a little bit at the beginning about gamification, and my question would be to anyone in the group here, could gamification apply to patients as a way of encouraging them to tell other patients about their clinical trial experience? Ethically, um, and, and in terms of what that might look like and what that platform might be, would it be appropriate, uh, we talked a little bit about gamification between sites for enrollment, but would it make sense in the industry to think about gamification from a patient perspective and how do we help patients want to tell other patients about their experience in trials? Um, so I'll just throw that out there as something I was thinking of. Uh, I'm Heather, I'm just speaking. This is Matt, am I able to respond or, or Tali, I don't, I don't want to speak yeah. on No, Matt, go for it, please. And, and so, just, uh, sorry, Matt, of course I told you to go for it and now I'm going to you. Sorry. Um, I just want to encourage everybody, raise your hand um, if you've got anything to say in response to that question Heather posed or anything um, that, the, that the panelists are saying. So please raise your hand, we'll bring you up, and Matt, go for it. Great. So this is Matt, and Heather, thanks for bringing that up. That's a really interesting concept. I have a lot of experience in my background with gamification in a different setting. And it's highly effective to promote community use of a platform. Um, and so I look at it from two perspectives. One, within the study and the patients participating, if you use gamification for things like, you know, say, adherence to visit schedules or adherence to medications, I think that has a lot of power in encouraging people to participate more strongly in the study and pay attention to that. So that's one, one thing. I don't think you mentioned that, but I would add. But to your direct question on promoting it with other patients, 
I would say absolutely. <clears throat> I think if you build it with the way to, to maybe post your badge on LinkedIn or Instagram or, or Twitter or these other platforms where people can get some level of credit for their participation in clinical research and making the world a better place and they can, they can throw their badge out to the world, so to speak. I think that has a lot of power. I think that's an awesome topic. This is Matt, I'm speaking. Yeah, I like that idea, Matt. Um, any other uh, inputs from anyone on the stage or in the room as it relates to gamification or to the broader topic around our one burning question, which is just what innovations in patient recruitment and retention are working or could help sites? And Alec, we brought you to the stage um, just a couple minutes ago. Any thoughts from you? Yeah, and let me know if I'm going on too much of a tangent here, but I, I had read something earlier this morning regarding the AstraZeneca vaccine about how, um, and I don't know if I'm getting the numbers exactly right, but I think it was 30 events out of the batch of 5 million that caused um, blood clotting. So I just wanted to sort of put it out there to some some of the people in the panel about what sort of um, things you would do to sort of educate um, people who aren't necessarily part of the scientific community as in terms of the sort of risk to reward ratio there. Cause I don't know what the, the percentage is if you divide um, 30 by 5 million, but in an event like that, what are the sort of things um, strategies that can be imposed to sort of remind people that um, obviously there's going to be some adverse events, but if you look at the amount of adverse events that happen, um, it's really doesn't outweigh the reward that this is giving and how do you sort of educate the population to sort of remind them that um, it really isn't that big of a risk. It's a good question. Um, I definitely do not have an answer to that. I, I think in some of our previous discussions, we hit on that topic, Alec, and it just conceptually um, how important it is that these in the industry are um, are are um, providing information to the world, the population, not just people who are participating in trials, but um, anybody who may participate in trials overall um, at some point in their life and, and just providing that type of uh, transparency and um, and just overall understanding, it's a tough one. If anyone in the room has any reactions or thoughts to, to what Alec posed, please feel free to raise your hand and bring you up. Um, I think one of the things that, maybe not specific to the question you just asked, Alec, but something you said just kind of got me thinking about something slightly similar. I mean, there's a lot of tools out there now um, that sponsors are providing for the trials that they're doing, which give patients more, patients that are participating in the trial, more information about their participation. We've been hearing, that research sites have been hearing, and, and sponsors have been hearing too, um, that patients want to know what's happening to them on the trial. And, and not just, oh, you had an average event, or, you know, oh, you're you're not compliant with your medication, or whatever. They actually want to know what happens <laughs> as they participate, the results of, of, of their lab work, um, the, the eventual approval or non-approval of the, of the medication they're taking, which may be 10 years after they participate, depending on how long the study is and what phase trial they participate in and things like that. So they want to be engaged, they want to be informed. Um, so some sponsors are are creating, you know, these sort of trackers that allow patients to see their progress. For example, if they're participating in a, a long study um, it, uh, where maybe maybe it's in sort of a metabolic or endocrine type study, it'll, these trackers allow them to see either their weight progression, if, if, it's, a, if it's a product that might impact weight, or their blood work, um, their HP. With C levels, depending on again the product and how what what it may affect, and so you know rather than putting it all on the site to respond to the questions that patients are asking, like doctor or coordinator, how you know how's my blood work and things like that, the sponsors are providing those tools direct to patients um, and giving that giving them direct access to that and allowing them to really see how those things track over time. 
Um, I'm finding that those tools are really welcomed by patients, but would love to hear from anyone in the room. Princess, you know, sort of looking at your picture directly here, given that you're working and actively recruiting at a site right now. You know, do you find tools like that to be of interest to patients? Um, and are there any other, uh, and by patients I mean trial participants, do you, are there any other tools that you think are similar to that or different that are, are innovative and effective? Um, yes, definitely. I think something like a tracker to uh, show the patient their progress or the participants their progress in the clinical trial does definitely help because um, if there is not a platform, they will take it upon themselves to do call the site and um, ask what their progress is and um, you know where they're at in regards to approvals and things that like that, especially if a patient thinks that a certain drug may be working, um, they're excited to see what the progress of it is. So definitely having a tool like that to just uh, main, mainstream um, giving out the information to patients so that no one is missed, especially, especially in a trial where there's um, a high enrolling uh, rate would be good. So I think there is something like that kind of similar right now that we're working with and something like Study Hub where all in one uh, app, they're able to make their appointments, they're able to chat. Um, it's not perfect yet, but you know, I think they're getting there where um, they're making those things available for patients to use easily through an app. Hi, it's Heather here. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Hanley. Uh, yeah, so, you know, of course, I'm, I'm in uh, Silicon Valley area. Right? So, uh, I think there's some I heard about it in some innovation uh, tech, medical tech uh, uh, clubhouse uh, room, right, where they're innovating, uh, utilizing uh, apps, right, to say, hey, uh, you know, participant will download this app and, and, and uh, it's a set of communication where you do every, everything in that app. They'll send you messages, they'll send you uh, reminders, they'll talk, they'll do everything. In the, in the clinical research sense, right? So, you know, uh, there's always been a bit of ways to, to do uh, clinical research. But you gotta find those, you know, uh, these either in Clubhouse or you know, these tech guys that, that you know, shows that, hey, I have apps. Um, I do think, like, one comment with, um, with these third party apps, I think what would be helpful is just having that direct. Um, communication from patient and having it go towards the site itself. Usually what I've noticed is that with these third-party apps, the information will go to the app and then whoever is in charge of the app will then communicate that to the site. So sometimes there's just that disconnect, like that immediate need for, you know, the, to answer the question. There's like that waiting period of you know, when can the site answer the app, and then when can the app provide that information to the participant. So I think just creating more of a direct contact through to the site may be helpful. Hi, it's Heather here. One of the things that came up uh, in another conversation that I was in was around uh, taking technical speak and making it makes sense and maybe something uh, and something that was part of that discussion was around is there an opportunity talking about these apps to have something within that that takes a lot of that technical information that a patient might hear about their study about their disease about their drug and turn that into more layman's terms and make it very very friendly for those patients because they might have questions and concerns as they go along they're going to hear a lot at the beginning they'll get onboarded and as time goes by, they still might have questions. And is there a way not only to integrate that direct engagement with their participation, but also to almost provide a, a glossary, a dictionary, a, a Q&A that, that is directly written by uh, uh, professionals, but is not in what they call doctor speak. And, and I think that there's something around that, that that has seemed to be very interesting in a lot of the discussions I've had. Um, so I think it could be relevant here too. I'm Heather, I'm done speaking. 
Yeah, that's great, Heather. Thank you. Um, just a reminder to everybody in the room, um, we're talking about innovations in patient recruitment, um, specifically posing some ideas around um, gamification, AI, patient concierges, sort of patient engagement trackers, things like that. We're wanting to know uh, any input on those. Are these innovations working? Are they not? What 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 would be a wish list of things that, that could help sites and help patients um, but maybe don't exist? So please feel free to raise your hand if you have some ideas on this and we'll bring you up to the stage. Um, and in the meantime, I wanted to circle back on gamification. The, you know, this was something that was brought up in last week's Clubhouse and uh, was sort of the, the impetus and inspiration for this week's. And this was something actually that Yasmin, who um, is in the room right now, that she sort of posed and it got us thinking about it. Um, not to put you on the spot, Yasmin, and you're not on the stage, but you know, you, you asked this question last week saying, you know, is gamification working? Is it something that could work? And, and you mentioned it in the context, I think, more of competition around um, building a friendly competition, so to speak, uh, for patient recruitment. And if you have any insights about that or if you want to pose a question there or not, please raise your hand and I'd love to bring you up to the stage. Let's invite you, invite you up. Thanks for um, raising your hand. Yasmin, welcome back. Hi, Tanya, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so the question around gamification, um, that kind of came from personal experience just um, working as CTA on two global clinical trials in phase three um, and kind of the challenge around um, our therapeutic area is in infectious disease and the challenge with like PIs being inundated with COVID and how to kind of motivate them and remind them and have our trial top of mind as well because we've had really slow recruitment, um, patient recruitment. So um, just ideas around like increasing competition between sites and exploring that and also yeah, just the kind of global um, role as well, and kind of testing waters with that. So um, we've tried it out in global newsletters and kind of um, having like graphs and that sort of thing, comparing. But obviously, it's kind of there's kind of a fine line between being demotivating and also trying to motivate sites, but that's kind of where I was looking at it, this kind of between sites and how to engage them through this kind of gamification. And I've seen, um, I don't know kind of what exact platforms, but I've seen, um, you know, dashboard technology um, whereby like if sites reach a certain enrollment figure, they get like bronze awards and that kind of thing and just um, comparing. So interested to hear kind of the room's thoughts around that. Matt, anybody? Any ideas? Yeah, I was going to jump in, Kelly. Thanks. Um, this is Matt. So Yasmin, I really like this topic of gamification a lot. We were just talking about it a few minutes ago too. I, I can see a lot of value in, um, I look at it more from the patient side, and you, you brought up patient recruitment, so I'm just going to dig in on that one for a second, uh, even though I know your, your broader question was around sites. So my company deals in that space. I actually don't like the word recruitment. I tend to say patient enrollment a lot. I think it's friendlier, but, but I realize that the industry term is recruitment. I think one of the biggest challenges, so, so we recruit or enroll patients who are not in the sites network or system. We try and find additional patients for one of the companies that are typically brought in by the sponsor or CRO to augment what the site's recruiting on their own. And one of the biggest challenges that we face, because we call, we cast a broad net, it's the patients we have relationships with through our work. And we try and bring them in through an, a, kind of a journey, if you will, into the study. And the final, the first step, of course, is learning a little bit about it. The last step of that journey is talking to one of our nurses who kind of fully qualifies that patient. And we hand them off to the site. So that's what we do. And we spend a lot of time in the analytics of what we call funnel dropout. And so this is patients who are dropping out along the way of the journey and why they may be dropping out. And of course, at many points, we may not know the patient by name or anything, but we may know attributes about them. For example, um, what channels might have brought them into to the, the funnel, so to speak, um, in terms of either it's advertising or digital marketing or, or whether it's through patient advocacy groups. So we look at the data a lot and we're constantly trying to figure out how to make that journey better for the patient and more encouraging to them. 
because we realize there's a lot of reasons people lose interest, but one of them is maybe they're not sure what they're doing and they get nervous and they, they want to stop doing it. Um, and I think gamification and the patient's journey into a clinical trial can have a huge impact if you think about rewarding patients for, hey, you were really quick to complete that screener. Um, you got through the step, the first step, you know, in the top 10% of all patients who come in and start to use our data to play into some kind of gamification to encourage them to keep going until they, they get a chance to talk to a nurse, um, which is a good thing, right? It's a great thing when a patient who has a motivating need in their life can talk to a live nurse about a problem they're having and the potential resource that can help. So we see gamification as something that can potentially encourage them to get that far in that journey. I know it's not directly related to your question around the sites, but I just wanted to throw that, that aspect out there too. I, I think there's a, a huge appeal for gamification in the patient's journey as well. This is Matt and Dundalk. Matt, I think this is Jimmy, and I, I think that's a great point. Just, just thinking about about my world, um, and, and for, for me and what we do, uh, gamification is really used as that as that motivation tactic to keep going. Um, it, it, that you think of, you know, someone can tell me to download Candy Crush a, a million times, not to oversimplify it or make light of it, but, you know, tell me to download Candy Crush a million times, but that one time I do and I start collecting those coins, you better believe I'm going to open it up again next time I have a few minutes. So um, that idea of, of, of some sort of digital currency, or currency is a bad term, but like a digital reward for completing tasks on time or completing tasks uh, consistently and things like that, I think gamification can play a huge role in that, in that sort of motivating factor. Um, in terms of drawing power in recruitment or uh, enrollment, um, one of the things that, that we use in the meetings worlds are, are things like leaderboards. Um, and of course, leaderboards will require some sort of consent from, from a patient to, to, to put out there or an, enroll, or an enrollee to put out there. Um, but you know, leaderboards and, and, and it, it, it initiates that that competitive nature that we all have. Um, so, so I think I think that sort of reward, that 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 currency or that that motivating carrot, if you will, um, from a from a motivation perspective. And then we've seen tactics with leaderboards do really well from a, from a drawing power perspective. Thanks very much for that, uh, Jimmy and Matt. Great, great suggestions. Um, we just brought Justin up. Justin, um, any insights from you? Hey, yeah, I just jumped up. So I, I just hopped into the room. I love the conversation that uh, Matt and, and Jimmy were having about gamification. Um, I didn't have a chance to even look at their, their bios closely enough to see what sort of environment they, they work in. But I was curious. So I, I manage clinical trials in a large academic medical center. Um, and our, I, I I get the impression from you know, you know being on clubhouse interacting with people that work more on the pharma side um, that our IRB is much more conservative about things than, than it is in other environments. Like I love that idea of gamification. I could never sell that to my IRB to bake something like that into a clinical trial protocol. So I'm just kind of curious in, in other environments or if, if there are other people that work in a more similar environment than I do. Is that something you run into or is that really kind of unique to, um, you know, where I am? So this is Matt. I don't think it's unique to you at all, Justin. I don't, I have, I don't have any experience with, we haven't put this in the platform, so it's something we're talking about. You bring up an excellent point about IRB approval and you say it's hard in your world. I, I, I can tell you one thing, we do it globally and there's nothing harder in the world than you work for us right now. Uh, in terms of their different countries and IRB approvals. So I, I think that's a, a really good point that, that should probably be thought about. I have no experience, but I'd love to hear if somebody else either on stage or in the audience does with that. This is Matt, I'm done speaking. Yeah, I also, um, you know, I, I think that this is a direction that um, pharma and biotech would be interested in going, but I think like some of the other top discussions that we've had, in previous clubhouse um, sessions where we said that there's this 
worry or hesitancy that there is something that would be out of compliance, that regulatory in any capacity, whether it's the IRB level or all the way up to authorities, would, would find certain aspects, um, you know, uncouth, I guess, <laughs> to adjust into your points and, and stuff. But I think that from what I've heard in conversations that I've been involved in um, with, with pharma in particular, there is, I think, a general, uh, um, I guess, willingness that this is something that, you know, we would like to explore. It, it, it falls nicely in line with patient engagement. It falls nicely in line with um, the ability to, um, you know, meet, meet patients where they are, if they're in the digital world and if they're online and things like that. Um, I think that there is, but the question is, it's very well said. I mean, how do we make that sort of thing happen in a way that regulatory, you know, you know, would find compliant? And I think that that's a great question. If anyone has any insights, please raise their hand. Um, it's a great, 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 great suggestion and question. Um, you know, I, I've just taken a look at the time here. I wanted to sort of give an opportunity, um, you know, to, to talk a little bit about the motivations around um, participating in clinical trials. We talked before about the resistance to maybe joining clinical trials um, and opportunities to increase trial participation. Um, Elizabeth, is this something that maybe you want to weigh in on um, or share some recent learnings on? Um, sure, Talia, and I'll be brief because I know we're kind of at time. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what we're learning is that, you know, uh, individuals that, I think somebody said it very well, we've just been educated as a globe and folks that weren't previously educated about clinical trials, you know, have been thrust into the realm and, you know, we've got a lot more awareness now than, than before, right? So what's interesting to us is we are seeing members when they are signing up um, in, you know, multiple double digits. Uh, agreeing to participate in a trial of some sort, whether that's a data, a data trial or, you know, an actual clinical trial. So it's just, it's an interesting finding. And so then the question becomes, you know, how does that uh, translate more broadly? Uh, and, you know, thinking about the funnel component, which I think, you know, others have articulated very well, because um, there's the, the first part on the recruiting or the enrollment, uh, as I think Matt mentioned, uh, but then also the retention, and and so I think lots to still be discovered, and I think that the Scott, the the dialogue that's been taking place about real patient engagement, real patient support, uh, is one that you know needs to continue because we know from the patients who have been with us on prior discussions that there's a lot of room for improvement all the way around, right? Everything from that very front inception. Uh, meaningful consent all the way through to you know what the heck is happening in this trial and you know is anything good coming of it as a result of my participation for X years right so we know the industry has uh, a lot more that can be done for patients so I'll pause there and Talia and give it back to you I'm Elizabeth and I'm done speaking thanks Elizabeth um, the conversation has been really great today. I've loved how we've been able to talk about uh, gamification, which Yasmin posted last week, and uh, more ideas again around uh, patient engagement, and it's been just really, really wonderful. Um, let's go ahead and we're sort of at our time a little bit over. One thing that's special about this clubhouse is that we always like to poll everybody for next week's burning question. Um, I think it's important that we're sort of driving discussion around what people want to talk about. So. Um, want to ask anybody that's on the stage or anybody that's in the room, please raise your hand if you have any suggested topics for next week. Um, one thing that uh, has been a common topic I've seen talked about is sort of what um, changes COVID has brought to clinical trials over the last year and sort of trying to anticipate the different strategies that are going to stick and other strategies that are going to change or things that are going to go back to normal um, as we see vaccine rollouts sort of happen. Great suggestion. Thanks, Alec. Any other suggestions from anyone on the stage or in the room, please raise your hand. I'm going to throw it out there, this, this topic we sort of left hanging at the end that Justin posed, which is 
could be gag gamification to really fly. <laughs> um, <Thanks. laughs> you know, I love that we're talking about it because it feels so, um, it feels like, well, of course this is what we should be doing, it, it, you know, but there, there's, it's a great, great question. I know we could get some compliance folks and some of the additional sponsors to join us and give their insights too. So I'm going to throw that out there for next week also. Any other suggestions from the room? I, one of the things that Princess had mentioned and, and a few others had mentioned was just around the fact that, you know, there are these tools out there, but there's not a lot of information about what's available. So at some point, and maybe it's not next week, but at some point it might be nice to do one about what is happening, who is using the most interesting techniques and tools and and what's been re working really well for them that, that others might not know about. And we might be able to sort of bring together a lot of folks using some of these most innovative and successful tools, apps, uh, approaches, and, and share those things for other people who might want to use those with their own studies and their own teams. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Heather. Any other last suggestions before we start to wrap here? <laughs> All right. Well, um, again, this has been a really wonderful collection um, of contributors, and, and it's been really wonderful to get this energizing group together every week. Hope you're enjoying it. Um, in addition to following us on Clubhouse, you can uh, click on our profiles. We can find LinkedIn and other um, other platforms and, and social channels that we're a part of. Um, feel free to DM or uh, send notes to us, those of us that are moderators, to suggest topics. Um, questions you want to discuss for our one burning question each week. And um, just in closing, uh, big gratitude out there to Heather, uh, Jimmy, Tammy, Princess, uh, everybody that came up from the stage, Julia, Elizabeth as well, and our entire audience for making this a really great discussion. And now back to Julie, our host. Um, thanks so much for helping the Courtney put this program together. Any last minute um, closing notes, Julie? Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks. Talia, it's been a really great discussion. Really appreciate everybody's contributions. Um, and, and just in closing, I'm uh, Julie, project manager at Consuli and host for this room. Um, we are now a club. Um, you can tap on the little green house at the top of this uh, conversation. We're Consuli Conversations. Join our club, become a member, and you will get notifications from us when we have our rooms. Um, those rooms are also listed in my bio. Uh, so you're welcome to follow me directly, uh, take a look at those, and I can ping you into rooms. Uh, also, uh, as Talia mentioned, my email is in there if you have any questions, comments, feedback, uh, suggestions, you want to throw a question into the hat, please do. Uh, and be sure to follow everyone else um, and each other if you find anybody interesting. And I'll leave this room open just a little bit for everyone to be able to check out everybody's profiles. Uh, to be able to follow each other. Um, and for those of you uh, that don't yet know Consoli broadly, uh, Consoli is a public benefit company with the mission to enable individuals to participate in the data economy. Experts suggesting our individual data being worth 20,000 per year. Uh, so we do this by operating a marketplace for members where we become their agent and assemble their data, including health records, labs, prescriptions, wearables, uh, quality of life surveys, things of that nature. Um, importantly, members receive smart matched individualized offers from us for opportunities, including to participate in clinical trials. Uh, so if audience members want to be part of the data dignity movement uh, and have us be their data agent um, or participate, well, if there's patients in this room to participate in clinical trials, we definitely um, suggest you sign up at consuli.net, that's C-O-N-S-U-L-I.net. There's no cost to join our movement. You can learn more about us uh, on our website, also in my bio. Um, check us out. And we look forward to next week's Clubhouse discussion. Um, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Happy weekend. Thanks, everybody. Have a great Bye. weekend. Bye.